Take your Bibles with me, open to Joshua. Joshua chapter 1, passage that I'm sure you're all familiar with. You probably heard about the woman who had a favorite verse in the Bible. Her favorite verse in the Bible was Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Repent and be baptized, therefore, for the remission of sins. And she would say that verse with people over and over and just go shopping. And as she's shopping, she would share that verse with folks. And Man, she was known as the Acts 238 gal. Well, on one occasion, one occasion, somebody broke into her home. And she's upstairs in her house. She's getting ready for bed and everything. But she hears noise and commotion downstairs. So she calls 911 to let them know, hey, there's an intruder in my house. Well, she hangs up the phone, and she thinks she starts to hear him coming up the steps, and she's getting scared, so she cries out, Stop! And all she could think of is, My verse, my verse. He needs to know my verse, so I'll share my verse. So she goes, Stop! Acts 2.38! She couldn't remember what the verse was, but she remembered the reference. Acts 2.38! Stop! Well, the police finally arrived, and wouldn't you know, he did. He stopped. He froze in his tracks, and he was not running away from the cops or anything. Well, the police, they were really surprised by that, and so they asked them, they said, well, what's the story here? Usually when we come on a burglary, the, the thief, the robber, man, he hightails it, he gets out of there. And that guy said, well, there was some crazy lady upstairs that all I heard her say was to stop because she had an ax in 238s. <laughs> Poor guy thought he was going to get blown away, I guess. I don't know. All right, what's it have to do with, that, uh, with Joshua chapter 1? Absolutely nothing, okay? All right. What's a good strategy for us as we move ahead with the gospel? Are there some principles that we can glean from Scripture for our personal life, our, our local church, our association, fellowship of churches? We need to be firm and resolute as it relates to our purpose with a declining morale and disposition of our culture. I think Joshua serves as a good biographical template on how we should advance for the glory of God. There are three features that really stand out concerning Joshua's life. And I'll tell you what they are up front here. Don't leave, okay, but I'll tell you what the outline is. Three points. We're going to see he is a minister, he is a militant, and he has a motivator. So let's take a look at these in Joshua 1. You're probably very familiar with this passage. You probably heard it preached. Maybe you've memorized portions of it as well. This is a great passage uh, for us this morning. Joshua chapter 1. I'm reading from the New King James. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise and go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. From the wilderness of this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and of the great sea, Mediterranean, toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Father, we thank you for those promises. We claim those promises. These are not just New Testament statements that are made that Uh, you will go with us, you will be with us, because the Lord Jesus Christ reiterated this in the Great Commission, and we see it elsewhere in the book of Hebrews. Uh, Lord, we're encouraged to know that we never go through this life alone, no matter how lonely we might be. I would pray that as we would look to the Word of God, that you would give us a sense of direction, that you would motivate us and encourage us, that we would go forth from this building uh, more apt to serve you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What a daunting task this is for Joshua. Have you ever had to follow a great personality, a great person, 
uh, I was asking our grandkids last night a little bit about presidential history, and I said, you know, uh, the first president is who? George Washington. Well, how would you like to follow George Washington in the White House? Wouldn't that be kind of a daunting task? Because so much was formulated around his presidency. Well, that second president let you try to guess who that person was, go through your U.S. history class. The second president and the third president, it's kind of interesting, when they had the inauguration for the third president of the United States, who was Thomas Jefferson, by the way, the man who was the second president of the United States said to Thomas, Jensen, uh, Thomas Jefferson, if you are as happy coming into this office as I am to leave this office, then you are a very happy man indeed. And you might know that that man was John Adams. He had a miserable, absolutely miserable presidency. Perhaps maybe the only one that compares to it is the presidency of William, was it William Howard Taft? Uh, not only did he get stuck in the bathtub, which was problem enough, but he got uh, harassed by Teddy Roosevelt, and um, eventually he was so miserable in the presidency, he said, all I want to do in life is become the chief justice of the Supreme Court, which he did by, uh, uh, by irony, I guess, there. Well, imagine following the great leader Moses. Go back just a page, at least a page of my Bible, Deuteronomy 34. Look at how Scripture gives a biography of him. Verse 10, Deuteronomy 34:10. But since then there has not arisen in Israel a prophet like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, in all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, before Pharaoh, before all his servants, and all his land. And by that mighty power and all the great terror which Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. Man, I don't know if I'd want to follow that guy, you know? He's up here. I'm just down here. How can I relate to that? Well, Joshua's greatness, <coughs> excuse me, is seen in his role as minister, a militant, and a motivator. Verse 1. <coughs> verse 1. You'll see in verse 1 that we have the title for Moses, uh, excuse me, for Joshua, and it is listed that he is going to be the assistant I think the old King James renders him still as minister. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm trying to get over a cough, and hopefully I'll get over it today. You can pray about that. What a terrible announcement is made. Moses, my servant, is dead. It's shocking, it's dreadful news, and now, Joshua, you are the new leader. It's up to you to lead my people. Well, Joshua had spent many years as an assistant or minister to Moses, he wasn't the number one guy in all those days. It's hard to be the number two person. It takes great humility to serve someone else. Joshua was not afraid to serve Moses no matter how menial the task. He knew his position was not about him. It was about someone else. We need to grasp that Christianity is not about me. It's not about my comforts. It's not about my desires, my kingdom. It's about Christ. It's about serving him. It's about someone else. My dear friend, Jesus interrupted your life and saved you, if indeed you know the Lord is your Savior, so that you would glorify God by serving him. Our primary focus in life ought to be to serve the Lord God. The Westminster Catechism, and we're not really in catechisms and all that. I understand that, but it is very pertinent and something I think we are familiar with. That catechism asks, what is the chief end of man? And there is an answer that comes along with it, that man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. How are you doing in that area? Are you really glorifying God alone? Does all that thrill your soul is Jesus? Is that what your attention and focus is upon? Jesus said, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, or riches, or treasures, or money. And I wonder sometimes in our life, as I examine my life, are there times that I have Christ being nudged out of that position of preeminence, and I'm trying to serve another master? The Thessalonians' reputation was that they turned to God from idols in order to serve the living and true God. 
It's not about me. It's not about you. For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. We should have a reckless abandonment for Christ and not ourselves. How's it going in your life? Is there evidence if we are on a, a trial, a court here? Is there evidence in your life that you know the Lord because of your overwhelming desire to serve Him? In our first church that I, I had the privilege of pastoring back in Iowa, just a small country, rural area, 300 people. Our church was about 30 people. We didn't have very many. But we had this one faithful deacon, Jim. And, and Jim was there at every single service. He says, Pastor, you know why I come to every service, why I'm so faithful in attendance? And I said, well, Jim, I, I really appreciate that you are here every Sunday, but no, you tell me. Why, why do you come every Sunday? He says, I've heard every preacher has a good, at least one good sermon in them, and I want to be here when you give yours. <laughs> so. But he said on another time, he says, you know why I'm here every Sunday? And I said, well, why? And he says, I want others to know whose side I'm on. I want others to know whom I'm serving, whom I'm giving allegiance to. And we learn that we best serve God by serving others, and Joshua served Moses. You like to serve others? For some of you, it comes very naturally, and perhaps even supernaturally, maybe a spiritual gift that God has enabled you to do. I can tell you this, and I tell my wife this, so I could never do what she does. My wife works in the hospice department of Mayo over in Mankato and Fairmont. And one word, geriatrics. <laughs> you know, that is just not something that I say, Woo, man, I can't wait to do that. And I'm sure she has her days, but she has a servant's heart, a servant's attitude. I imagine the disciples had maybe the same reaction that I have in regard to washing feet, serving the others. Back in the 70s, there was a book put out by Charles Swindoll. It was the first book that I remember reading. I was a teenager. Oh, that tells you how old I am. Um, I, I read that book, and it really had a profound impact on my life. Improving your serve. Nothing to do about tennis, okay? But all about how are you at serving others? How are you at ministering to others? To reach out, to, to help them in their time of need. I confess that that's an area in my life that I just constantly have to work at. But we ought to be masters in the course of servanthood. Joshua was Moses' servant, assistant, minister. Jesus came to minister to others. For even as the Son of Man did not come to be saved, or to be served rather, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You probably heard the story about Leonard Bernstein. He was once asked, What's the most difficult instrument to play? His answer, the second fiddle. He said, I can get plenty of first violins, but to find someone who can play the second fiddle with enthusiasm, that's a problem. And if we have no second fiddle, we have no harmony. Serving others means placing their interests first. Their desires come first. They come before mine. Consider these admonitions in regard to our service. Jesus said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those that are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whosoever desires to be great among you, let him be your servant. Man, you want to be number one? Serve others. For you have been called to liberty, brethren, not... Uh, only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Use your freedom in Christ to help and assist others. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another. You have been given spiritual gifts so that you might help others. Let me ask you this very pointed question. Whom have you served last week? And let me update that. Whom will you serve this week? Put a name in there. Put a face in there. Joshua was the minister. Number two, Joshua was the militant. Joshua was the militant. Look at verses three and five. 
He has given this instruction that every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I've given that to you, as I said to Moses. Verse 5, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your... Man, wouldn't you love to have that promise from God? You know, nobody can compare to you. As I was with Moses, was God with Moses? Oh, yeah. So I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Too much of modern day Christianity, Western Christian life, is focused on entertainment. But we are not on the play field, but rather, according to Scripture, we're on the battlefield. Joshua was a fighter, he was a militant. This speaks of his bravery. When you go through the book of Joshua, you see he was a fighter. Joshua chapters 4 and 5. You know, do you guys still do the Gilgal day camp here? Okay, you used to, and I had never heard of that, and I never knew what the significance of it was. We had kids that would come to camp that had a Camp Gilgal shirt on, and you know what happens to people if they wear a different camp shirt when they come to the lake, or they get introduced to the lake, I should say. But uh, anyway, all, having said all that, you know, this Camp Gilgal, what's, what's the significance of Gilgal? Gilgal is not a city per se. It is more of a place. Literally, the idea of the rolling of stones, and that's when Israel had passed through uh, the, the Jordan River. The first area that they came to, to was Gilgal, and there they had made a monument of stones to remember what God had done for them in allowing them to get over the Jordan. They remembered that, and that was the beginning of their conquest of the promised land. You get to chapter 6, you get to Jericho. Again, Gideon, and not Gideon, rather, Joshua, he is a militant here. He's a fighter, right? And so he uses the, the most convenient, modern strategy known to man, right? Circle the city. Don't say a word. Do it every day. Hmm. I wonder if they teach that at West Point. Okay? That's, that's crazy talk. And you know, on the last day, as they went around the city several times, they blew the trumpets, the walls come down, they go in, they get a miraculous victory. Chapter 7 and 8, Ai. And here again, Joshua the militant. It's interesting, he never consulted with God before going to Ai, and that was the only defeat that he had. He comes before God. God, what, what happened? You said that we were going to win it all. And God had to say, well, there's sin in the camp, and you have to deal with that sin in the camp. And so they do that, chapter 7. So chapter 8, after that's been dealt with, he now consults God. God gives them a strategy. He goes up, they win. <coughs> Excuse me, chapter 10, further battles against the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, and others. Exodus chapter 17. Let's go there. Exodus chapter 17. Lest you think that these are isolated events in his life, when we get to the book of Exodus, we find that he was already a fighter. He was already a militant. Exodus 17, bear with me, I went to 7. Exodus 17, verses 9 through 13. He's fighting the Amalekites. Now Moses said to Joshua, Choose us some men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. And so Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And so it was when Moses held up his hands that Israel prevailed. Wouldn't it be great if it was just that easy in battle? But here, as they're exercising through faith, it was. And when he let down his hand, his hand gets tired. Amalek prevailed, but Moses' hands became heavy. And so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Ur, Hur supported his hands, one on one side, the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Joshua was not new to this militancy. That was his nature. I used to think, even as I read Joshua chapter 1, and I remember doing a baccalaureate service one time, and in that baccalaureate service I was mentioning the fact, you know, Joshua, he must have been very timid. He must have been very shy. Because God has to tell him over and over, be courageous, be strong, get up at it. And I always pictured him, man, he must have been some kind of a wimp. 
But no, that's not the same Joshua that we find in the Word of God. Now, admittedly, there was and is, and I hope I don't get in trouble here, but I think I've got a kindred spirit here with me. There was and is a militancy from primarily fundamentalism that was misplaced. Far too often we gave strict attention to the length of hair or length of dresses, dress codes, Bible versions, and more while neglecting weightier matters of spirituality like our own personal sanctification and discipleship of others. How do we need to be militant in our life? Now, we're not going to go out and actually take a sword and slay all the pagans of Rochester, although there are sometimes. <laughs> you know, you think that. But, uh, you know, what is our militancy? I want to give you two areas. One is we need to be militant about our personal holiness. Militant about our personal holiness. Notice the emphasis here in Joshua chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, about the book of the law. Now, what was the book of the law? That was the Pentateuch. Okay, that, that's the earlier revelation that has been provided and given. Verse 7, be strong, be courageous, that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, has commanded you. Do not turn from it either way, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you will observe to do all that is written therein, and then you'll find your way prosperous and have good success. Doesn't that sound kind of redundant? Have good success? Can we have bad success? We do. You betcha, I guess, to my Minnesota <laughs> crowd here. Many are having a successful life apart from the Lord. We're successful in business. We're successful in finance. We're successful in sports and school. Yet we're leaving the Lord out of the equation. You know, you just read on the screen this, what's sometimes called a covenant or an agreement that you had, you have as a church body, and so much of it focused in this area. Hey, we can actually have a successful church here with awesome preaching, great numbers, inspiring music, a dynamic youth ministry, yet doing things through our own strength and ingenuity. That type of bad success, that type of success is indeed a failure. Again, I'll repeat what Jesus said in John chapter 15. I said this during Sunday school. Jesus said, without me, you can do a few things pretty good, right? No, without me, you can do nothing, absolutely nothing of spiritual value. Every plan that is made as a local church, every plan that is made in my personal holiness, my personal life, I get on my knees before God. Is this what you want me to do? You will have good success as you incorporate and assimilate God's word, God's law into your life. Be militant about personal holiness. Be militant about reaching the lost, about advancing the gospel against Satan's domain. We are in a dogfight. We are in a spiritual battle. William Booth, who is the founder, was the founder of the Salvation Army, he died many years ago. Um, he had said, if we could visit hell for five minutes, that would do more than anything else to prepare us for a lifetime of ministry, of soul winning. He also said, I like this one, if I thought I could win one more soul to the Lord by walking on my head and playing the tambourine with my toes, I'd learn how. <laughs> I like that. Listen to Scripture. We are to fight the good fight as we wrestle against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. We put on the whole armor of God in order to stand against the wiles of the devil. We are to contend earnestly for the faith and to resist the devil. These are fighting words, folks. They're verses that are drawing us into a battle. So we engage the enemy. We engage him in his domain. We are not ashamed of the gospel since it is the power of God to salvation. We are witnesses of him to the ends of the earth. We are always ready to give a defense to everyone who asks us for a reason for the hope that is in us. Oh, I wish it was just that easy, right? But how many times have we been given opportunities 
a prime opportunity to share the gospel with somebody. Maybe we're in a restaurant. Maybe it's our neighbor. Maybe it's a relative. And we don't do it. <coughs> Excuse me. I wince at the missed opportunities to share Christ in my own life. I want to do it, but I often feel uncomfortable. And I was challenged with this thought recently. Christianity isn't designed to make us comfortable. Christianity isn't designed to make us comfortable. You know, Muslims blow themselves up for a God who can't save. Now, that's not to say that's the militancy that we take. Obviously, we don't do that. We express ourselves in love. But we do need to be courageously bold. We are to be militant in the right sense. And if you think you can't do it, put yourself in Joshua's shoes. How can I follow Moses? How can I win these battles that seem so daunting as they're laid before me? Well, look at the promises that you have. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Did Jesus ever say that to us as believers in the New Testament age? For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Oh man, those are promises I need to hear. So as I share the gospel with my friend and my, my loved one and my neighbor and whoever I face on the marketplace, I'm re very mindful of the fact that Christ is working through me and using me in that setting. And if there is a rejection that is made, it is not of me. They're rejecting him. Oh God, grant us opportunities to be bold for you this week. Let me hurry on. The third one. Joshua the motivator. Joshua the motivator. Go with me to the book of Numbers. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers 14. Numbers 14. You say, well, where at in Joshua 1 are you getting this motivator feature? And admittedly, I'm, I'm copying a lot here from Numbers chapter 14. Um, starting with verse 6. Numbers 14, verse 6. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. Now, the context here is they've, they've sent spies into the promised land. And the spies, you know the story. You know what happens. The kids could say this story. Well, we went in there, and man, oh man, this land, whoo, it was nice. We would love to have that land. But there's giants in the land. Man, these people are valiant people. How can we overcome such an obstacle as this? Twelve spies went in. And ten spies had that story. And they came back very discouraged, very defeated, very downtrodden. And here we are, verse 6. Joshua, the son of Nun and Caleb, the son of Jephudah, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes. Great grief. And they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we pass through to spy out is indeed an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them. Then the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. You know, I really like how God infuses motivation into Joshua in chapter 1. Be strong, be courageous. And again, I used to think he was a wimp. I don't think that's the case. I think he's just reminding him, remember way back when, when you saw the promised land, how bold you were, continue in that boldness. He infuses Joshua with this motivation so that he can motivate the people of God to win all these battles. Caleb and Joshua, wow, these giants look mighty small in comparison to their God. Let's go! You know, We can do it! We can win! 
That type of motivation and excitement is not always wanted or appreciated. The Israelites wanted to stone Joshua and Caleb, but God blesses that type of obedience, that type of faith, as seen with their longevity in life as all the others ended up dying. God infuses Joshua with this motivation so that he can share it and challenge others. Where does Joshua do this? I believe he does it in the various battles. Some of those battles seem really ridiculous, like Jericho. But yet, as the children of Israel were motivated through his leadership, they followed. Imagine all the good that could be done if we would just encourage one another. I don't know the church atmosphere, what's going on. Um, I hope you're a body that just loves to build up others. I, I love to be around people like that. They always have a compliment. They always have something good to say. They always speak in faith. And I've been around the other people that tend to see things on the darker lens of life, and they're always critical, always foreboding. Hey, that's not, that's not Joshua. One of the reasons why we come to church is for that encouragement. And let us not consider one another in order, uh, excuse me, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Yeah, man, I want to encourage others. I want to motivate others. I want to be like Joseph. You say, who is Joseph? I don't remember that guy. Well, you know him by his surname. He was given a nickname in the Bible of Barnabas. And everywhere he went, he was encouraging and motivating others. In fact, Barnabas itself means son of consolation, son of encouragement. And as you go through the book of Acts, real quickly, Acts 4, you don't turn there, but uh, in Acts he sold a land and gave the proceeds to the church. Wouldn't it be great if somebody sold land and gave the proceeds and, hey, just use the money however you need it. Okay? And that was a problem a little bit later in chapter 5 because Ananias and Sapphira thought, man, this guy has great esteem among the people. Why don't we sell a possession? We'll only give a portion of the proceeds to the church, but we'll claim that we did it all and it'll be all right. And no, that was not all right. Acts chapter 9, the disciples are afraid of Paul, not trusting this new conversion of his. But Barnabas vouches for him and introduces him to the apostles. Acts 11, he reached out to the Gentiles when others were hesitant to reach Gentiles with the gospel. Acts 13 and 14, he is joined with Paul to preach the gospel to these Gentiles. Acts 15, he motivated John Mark to go on a missionary journey with him. So much so was that a divisive issue that Saul refused to go with him. Paul refused to go. And so actually two missionary teams went out. How are you at encouraging others, building others up, trying to get them to keep the faith? Joseph was a motivator, he was a militant, he was a minister. And I would again come back to how I began the message. What do these mean to you personally? What do these mean to you as a local church? And then what do they mean to us as an association? Isaac Watts had it right, I think. Am I a soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb? Shall I fear to own his name, or own his cause, or blush to speak his name? Must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease, while others fought to win the prize and sailed through bloody seas? Are there no foes for me to face? Must I not stem the flood? Is this vile world a friend of grace to help me on to God? Sure, I must fight if I would reign. Increase my courage, Lord. I'll bear the toil, endure the pain, supported by thy word. I don't know about you, but as I hear that hymn, I see Joshua 1 all over it. Will you join me in prayer? God, I would pray that you would help us to be individuals like Joshua here this morning. Um, it's, it's a little bit humbling because we realize we're called to a different ministry and it's a little bit different in our life than it was during the day and time of Joshua, but yet these same principles are, are things that ought to be seen in our life. Help us to be ministers. Help us to serve one another. 
Help us to be motivators, to find reasons to infuse hope in those who are around us, to take a positive path and not negative. And Lord, I I know the last one here is a little hard because we are not confrontational people by nature. But help us to be militant, militant about our own personal holiness. Militant with the gospel. God, lay some soul on our heart today that we might reach that person for Jesus Christ. I pray this in his name. Amen.